Hey parents, have you ever asked your children, how was school today? Did they ever answer, school is dumb? Well then, this podcast is for you. Listen in as we unpack why children say, school is dumb, and discover what it really means. I'm your host, Shannon Hazel, also known as the Parents Educator. After 25 years of teaching and being a parent myself, I've heard every reason as to why school is dumb. So let's dive in and uncover what it really means. Welcome back to the podcast and thanks for joining us. Today's topic is so interesting. I wish I knew half the things I know now about this topic when my children were little. My older son was a classic sensory avoider. And as a parent of young children at the time, I remember thinking things like, is he doing this to drive me nuts? Why does he have to take his socks off everywhere we go? Why does he fight me about putting underwear on every day? Uh, Why does he have to smell everything? And if it didn't smell right... Uh, he would have nothing to do with it. So I remember this one time, you're just going for a routine checkup at the dentist. And, oh, I think he was probably about six or seven. And I open the door to the dentist office and he takes a step in and he's like, I'm not going in there. He backs out the door. So I let the door go and I'm like, what's the matter? It smells funny. Like, what do you mean it smells funny? It smells funny. I'm not going in there. I'm like, well, honey... We're just, we've got to go to the dentist. we got to get our teeth clean, you know, trying to coax him in the door. And he was adamant he was not going in there because it smelled funny. So, you know, you get a little firmer as a parent. And I'm like, no, we are going in here. Like, come on, it's the dentist. You've done this before. So we sit down in the chairs and he literally is starting to gag, telling me he's going to be sick if I make him stay there where it smells funny. And then proceeds to lay down on the chair and take my sleeve and put it over his face and hold it there the entire time till it was time to go into the dentist's office. And then, of course, when we left, or, well, actually, we hadn't even left. We are still in front of, like, the receptionist. He announces, I'm never coming back. <laughs> this place smells. I'm like, oh, my goodness. So I get what it's like uh, to be the parent of a child who is sensory avoidant. Um, so I'm happy to welcome back to the podcast today, Evie Kiru. Evie is an occupational therapist. She's been here before. And she works daily in the elementary school setting. She brings with her a wealth of knowledge and is here today to help us understand more about sensory processing and its impact on our children at school. She'll also be sharing some great strategies that can be used to help children that are sensory avoidant to do their best at school. Welcome, Evie. Thank you so, so much, Shannon, for having me here today as a guest. It is so exciting to be part of this podcast series. Well, I'm so happy you chose to come back. We had a fantastic uh, conversation last time you were here, and I'm so looking forward to our topic today about sensory processing and more specifically uh, children who are sensory avoidant. So why don't we start at the beginning like we typically do with uh, tell us a little bit about what is sensory processing. So what a great starting point when we're talking about our sensory avoiders. And how cute was that story that you <laughs> told about your son? I couldn't help but kind of chuckle to myself because I I just think back to many experiences I've had when working with children who tend to be sensory avoidant or more sensitive to certain kinds of sensory input in their environment. Um, so let's start with defining what sensory processing is in our minds so that we can have a better understanding of how we can help our kiddos that are a bit more sensitive to certain kinds of sensations. So sensory processing, and to to really kind of get at the root of what it is, is the ability of our nervous system to register information coming in from our senses, interpret that information, and then help us determine what action we need to take to respond to our environment. So part of that is understanding what our senses are. So there are some common ones that many people are already aware of, and we know that 
our senses help us interpret what's going on in the world around us, how we make sense of our environment and know how to respond appropriately. So some common ones include what we see, so the visual system, what we taste, what goes in our mouth, what we hear, what we're listening to, the sense in our environment, so what we're smelling, and we call that the olfactory system in very fancy jargony terms. <laughs> <laughs> so, but really what it has to do is with the smells and scents that we uh, encounter, such as when we go to the dentist office. Exactly, I know that one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that was a, a very good example that you gave of a child that does have that increased sensitivity mm -hmm. to scent. And the other some of the other sensory domains, I like to call them, that are really important for helping us determine how to interpret the world around us, is this idea of touch. So it's the tactile system. So I really want to kind of take your mind beyond just what we think of traditionally as feeling with our hands, because we know that touch can happen to other parts of our body, such as the feet. So a common example for some of our friends who are sensory avoidant to touch is that you may not see it necessarily with the hands, or if you see it with the hands, you may also see it with the feet, for example, if they're walking on barefoot grass, or if they don't like the feeling of the shoes mm -hmm. on their feet, or if they don't like wearing socks, that can even create um, some very interesting conversations or power struggles between an adult and a child who is sensory avoidant. And, and I'm sure we'll have great conversations about what that looks like too. Um, moving on to some of the lesser known sensory systems or sensory domains, as I like to call them, we've got something called the proprioceptive system. Mm -hmm. So important because it has to do with our sense of body awareness, knowing where our body ends and where the world around us begins. And a part of body awareness is that it, it kind of links to some of the other sensory systems, such as touch, because when you get a sense of deep pressure touch, that actually activates the proprioceptive system as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means, um, not so much in today's topic, but perhaps in a future conversation mm. around sensory seekers. So yes. you can see <laughs> that there's so many different avenues and topics and directions that we can take when it comes to sensory processing. Um, the last two areas of sensory processing I'd really like to talk about is balance. And this is also known as the vestibular system. And what I like about this system is it actually works in tandem or together together with other sensory systems such as the visual system because we need to know where our, our body is in space, how fast it's moving, and part of that is being able to see what direction we're going in. The last sensation is actually a newer kind of sensory domain that not a lot of people are really familiar with, but it's something that's very near and dear to my heart um, because it has so many applications for how we feel calm and regulated in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And this is what we call interoception. And all it really boils down to is what sensations are happening inside our bodies. So think about when you're hungry knowing what sensation is happening that signals your body that it's time to eat something. Think about sleep, knowing when you're feeling tired, you might need a nap, you might need to go to sleep for the night, those types of things. Okay, well that, like you said, is a lot of information and there's, you know, a lot of um, <clears throat> sensory information that our body is getting more than just the five senses maybe we learned about in school, right? Absolutely. Um, and that's where I think um, that we could go on and on and on with sensory topics. Uh, but today we're, we're specifically going to focus on children who are sensory avoidant. So there's something in their sensory environment that they are trying at all costs to avoid. And back to that sock example for a second. Again, as a parent of young children, I would think, oh, he's just being a stinker, taking his socks off everywhere we go, every time we're in the car. But there really is a reason for it. He's not just trying to drive me nuts. <laughs> no, he's and absolutely I, <laughs> not trying to drive you nuts. <laughs> and I think that's, you know, my biggest message in this in this episode is to parents who whose children do those things and we're just seeing them at that surface level as taking off socks. 
Um, and really there's so much more behind it. So hopefully parents listening today will, will get a little bit of that information and understand and, and maybe come at those um, situations with their children from a little bit of a different place um, once we kind of go through our topic today. So I'm super excited about this. Okay, so sensory avoidance. If you're a parent at home listening right now and you have, you know, maybe a toddler or a preschooler um, and they're thinking, hmm, this kind of sounds like my child. Are they sensory avoidant? Are they not? What might be some of those early indicators for parents that their child could be a sensory avoider? What a great question. <laughs> there are so many things I think that we can look out for as parents, as teachers, as caregivers, really anybody that works or comes into contact with children on a regular basis. Um, so some of those indicators, I think um, it might be helpful to break them down by sensory domain okay. because what can happen is that a child might be sensitive to a certain kind of sensory input but they might be completely fine with another kind of sensory domain. So let's give some concrete examples so we can really start to give our listeners an idea of how they can start to identify some of these signs in their children. So let's start with the auditory system, what we're hearing. Oftentimes, a child who is sensitive to sound dislikes the noises that they're hearing. Um, oftentimes it goes beyond just noises and it tends to be loud, unexpected sounds that are happening. Um, for example, if you think of a child that's quite um, bothered by the noise of the vacuum cleaner or the blender, um, in schools you often see students that have a hard time managing with fire alarm drills because it's just simply too loud for them. Or perhaps they really start to break down in their learning because they can't manage with how much sound is coming from the, the other children around them. When things get really busy, chaotic in the classroom, especially if there are group activities that are happening or there's a movement break happening. Again, it's just really keeping an eye out for those kids that tend to cover their ears. They might squeal, they might scream if they, they are nonverbal and don't have the ability to talk about what's happening inside of their bodies. Um, so that's one example of how sensory sensitivities can come out in terms of that hearing domain. Okay, and so what would be another example? Um, I don't know, where do you want to move to next? Why don't we uh, continue with touch? Because I feel like that's such uh, yes. a common one. And what a, a great tie-in to some of the examples that you gave at the beginning of our podcast conversation today. So with touch, you may have a child who resists being cuddled or... The tricky thing is they might like cuddles, but it's on their terms. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes they might come to you, they might give you a little side hug or a shoulder hug, and it's not that they don't like affection. It's that what they're trying to do is that their sensory system is so overloaded, they're trying to control how much their bodies are coming into contact with that touch in a way that feels comfortable without overwhelming them. And so you might... Again, you gave some really great examples in this domain already. They might like having their clothing off. So I've had many a toddler when I'm working with my families um, say, oh, my, my child constantly likes stripping. Mm -hmm. And, you know, <laughs> while, you know, and sometimes this even happens when they're doing potty training. So oftentimes it's really being able to kind of look out for those indicators and becoming what I like to call a sensory detective to figure out if this is almost a, you know, a once, a one-off occurrence, or is this something that parents are seeing over time consistently in multiple environments? Mm -hmm. So it's happening at home. It's happening when you go over to your cousin's house for a play date or to your friend's house. Um, it's happening out in the community where they're constantly, even if it's not all of their clothing, perhaps it's taking their socks off. Perhaps it's they only like certain kinds of shoes or the feeling of certain kind of clothing or fabric. So you might be thinking to yourself, gosh, my child is so picky. <laughs> my goodness. <Yeah. laughs> I think another common one there is uh, that I know I've experienced as well is your child wants to wear the same outfit every day because they've found that pair of pants and that shirt that don't bother them, that, that they don't have that reaction to. So 
of course, in their little brain, they're thinking, I'm going to wear this every day because this one actually doesn't bother me. And what we see as parents is, you can't wear that outfit to school every day. What are the teachers going to think? They're going to think I don't do laundry. They're going to think I don't buy you clothes. And so as a parent, we see it from a much different lens than what the child might be you know, experiencing. Absolutely. And what I love about that example is to our kiddos that are sensory avoidant. So for example, if they are sensitive to touch and they have a hard time really tolerating the sensation of certain fabrics on their skin, what might feel normal to us in our minds is actually feeling quite chafing. It almost mm. feels like somebody's taking a really deep bristle brush and scrubbing it against their skin. So I think a lot of the times it's really a kind of shifting our thinking to trying to put our minds in the minds of our child mm -hmm. to understand that this is not something that they're willfully trying to do. They're, it's not that they're trying to embarrass us in any way. It's because it's a true sensory need. I think another one that many parents experience is the brushing the hair, especially, you know, if your child has long hair and you're just trying to get out the door in the morning and you're like, let me brush your hair. And they're, oh, that hurts. It's too hard. And you're thinking, I'm barely touching you. But truthfully to that child, probably feels like, I don't know, maybe you can describe what that might feel like to a child yeah. who is sensory avoidant in that way. Oh my goodness, I can only imagine what m must be going on in their little minds um, because I've seen it time and time again in my clinical practice. You have a child or even an older child, you know, again, I know sometimes we talk about toddlers, but this is something that can happen across all age spans, even in adults. It's not something that just magically disappears mm -hmm. as the child ages, as I'm sure you can. Right, because mine's now relate. 20. Yes. <laughs> so, so, but the nice thing about that too is I think if parents, the earlier we can start identifying some of these sensory sensitivities in our children, mm -hmm. the, the more proactive we can be about teaching them strategies so that we can start helping them build their own awareness mm -hmm. and their own understanding of what tools and strategies they can use to help them almost come to terms with the sensory environment when it's too overwhelming for their right. bodies. And I also think that um, even just being able to say to your child, I understand that when I brush your hair, it feels like I'm doing it really hard and really rough. And maybe here, let's go, let's go to the store. Let's try to pick what brush do you think is soft and might feel better. And that goes a long way. Just, I think for children, knowing that you're understanding what's going on within them and you're trying. And then in turn, you might get a little more cooperation from them and some better language about how they're feeling and expressing to you what's going on um, and how we can just make that whole little scenario better for both ends and get out the door in the morning, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And what I also <clears throat> love about that kind of approach is what you're doing is you're being what we call a co-regulator for that child. And you're empathizing with them. You're entering into their world and helping them understand that it's okay that they're sensitive to these sensations. That doesn't mean they're bad in any way. It's just about helping them understand how they can get the most out of the world around them and a really adaptable function. And I way. think that's an important point. Um, when we don't like children's behavior, or when we try to, we communicate in a negative way about their behavior, they internalize that as I'm bad. Right. Not as I have a sensitive head that doesn't like the brush. They every time we're in a scenario with our children, whether at home or at school, and we're pointing those things out, it's going in their little brains as I'm bad. Exactly. Right? I'm not good. There's something wrong with me. So we have to be very, I think, careful as parents and as educators um, that we really, even though we're sometimes rushed and pressed for time, that we take that time to communicate with children on a level they can understand and let them know. Um, you know, I don't know what it feels like when I brush your hair because it doesn't feel like that when I brush my hair, but I get that your experience is different and we're trying to figure this out. And I love that. What a great example of what it means to be a sensory detective, to be able to do that for our children, to identify what they need and to give them the tools to be successful. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love that. 
All right. Well, which systems should we talk about now? There, so um, many systems to go through. <laughs> senses, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So the next one I'd love to talk about is one that's lesser known. It's that sense of movement in space. So that's something that we call in very fancy therapy terms, the vestibular system. So these children who tend to be more sensitive to movement, you might see them avoid playing on the playground with other children. It could be that they avoid going on the swings or they don't like going on the slides. And you wonder, why is my child not wanting to participate? They're social. They love being around other children, but why are they so fearful mm -hmm. almost? And that's what we like to call um, gravitational insecurity because they feel really unsteady on their feet. And anytime there's any kind of quick change of movement or head position, that can feel really unsettling to their body, much more so than it might be for us as adults if we don't have that same sensitivity. Um, and another way that you might come across this as a parent, especially you tend to see it a little bit early on in the toddler years when children are still getting bathed or you're changing their diapers. It's when you're you're helping them move backwards or lay on the change table. So that change in head position of leaning back, they don't know where their head is going. So they're right. very fearful and you can almost see a startled look in their eyes. They might squeal, they might cry, they might protest, they might say, oh, I don't like being changed. Mm -hmm. You might start to see some avoidance around bathing altogether, and then you might think, oh my goodness, how am I going to clean my child? And, and I think yeah. I, I can imagine in my head right now, like when you're laying that child down on the change table or in the bath, and they're kind of holding their head forward as you're leaning them back, almost trying to fight with that, like, no, 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 I want to stay up, right? And I think that sometimes we might even misunderstand that as they don't want a diaper change or they don't like when I wash their hair, but really it's that sense of instability. Absolutely. And really trying to determine, is this something that's happening time and time again in lots of different situations? I think it's sometimes it's also looking to see, um, is it that they're trying to is it that they're looking for um, attention or is it that they're seeking something specifically or they're trying to avoid a certain experience? Because sometimes what can happen is we really have to figure out if this is more of a behavior mm -hmm. response. Um, and again, that I, I will avoid talking about that because that's not part of my usual scope of practice. So I can't speak too, too much about that here on today's podcast. But oftentimes you'll know it when you see it, when mm -hmm. it's, it's consistent and it happens from one environment to the next. Whereas when it's more behavioral, it tends to be limited to certain situations. Mm -hmm. Like I'm thinking about... Um you know, you're saying where that child's maybe standing against the school wall, not running around and playing with their friends. That's such a hard scenario for a teacher to navigate, right? Because it could be, are they just tired and having a bad day? Did their friends hurt their feelings? Maybe they're not friends today. Um, is it what you're talking about here? Like there's, there's so many things it could be. So kind of filtering through all of that to determine you know, is this truly the case? What's going on here um, can be very hard in a, a school setting, but also probably equally as hard at home um, in, a, in, your, in your home, right? So for Absolutely. parents. Okay, so we talked a little bit about uh, what parents might be noticing at home. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the school. So if uh, your child is showing some sensory avoidance at school, what types of things might the teacher be telling you as a parent? So this can actually go a couple of different ways because as you can imagine, you've, I'm sure you've been on the, the other end where you're telling the occupational therapist or a parent some of the sensitivities that you're noticing right. when you're in, at school or in the classroom or at recess time in the bathroom. There's so many different environments where these kind of sensitivities come out. Um, so one example is a sensitivity to sound. They might constantly say, oh, it's too loud in here. I can't concentrate. I need to go and get a drink from the water fountain. Oh, I'd like to work in the hallway. Yes. I can't sit by this person. Can I go to the, the LST's office, the resource teacher's office? Can I go to the office to get something? Oh, can I go home and call my parent? Mm -hmm. And there, so you can see there's so many ways that children um, can creatively try to avoid 
environments where noises are too loud or overly stimulating for them. And I think that's probably one of the most popular ones we see at school, right? I feel like in every classroom, there's those kids who prefer to work in the hallway. And sometimes we might think, oh, they're trying to always get out of class. They want to go in the hallway and fool around. But really, they're just trying to escape the noise of the classroom, right? There are those kids, and I was one of them, that needs silence to learn. Like if I'm in a in a you know conference or something, and and they're giving us a moment to read something, an article, what have you, I literally cover my ears in order to read because it's like I can't read and think if I can hear all this noise, right in the background. Um, so yeah, taking a second look at that and. And it's so hard because is it that they need movement or are they avoiding the noise in the classroom? So sometimes, like you said, you have to be a little bit of a detective. But noise is definitely, I feel like, one of maybe the first indicators um, is, is a child coming home and saying my classroom is too noisy. And that's one I hear a lot from, from students and from parents. Absolutely. What a common thing that we encounter as teachers, as occupational therapists, even just as parents who are a little bit more familiar with what it means to be sensory avoidant. Um, absolutely. It's so tricky for these children to be able to learn and to really focus and concentrate, especially when things are getting really busy or active or there's an exciting activity that's happening in the classroom. Um, the other one I think about is, uh, you know, my visits to JK and SK classrooms sometimes, uh, middle of winter, whole class is outside and, you know, that child on the floor refusing to put on that snowsuit. There is no way that snowsuit is going on. And again, um, you know, at the surface level, that could look like, well, they're just not cooperating. They're being stubborn, you know, they're strong willed. But I may have also been the kid that hates the big bulky coat and that sort of thing. And so I can a little bit understand that when I see that happening in a school sometimes, I'm like, I know how she feels, right? Oh, so. <laughs> absolutely. And that's the other thing too, is that you might see, so it's a great example that you gave with the snowsuit. That same thing might happen with the gloves or the hat, especially if you have a child that's sensitive to touch around the scalp mm -hmm. or the hair. So thinking back to that hair brushing example or hair care example that you had given, they those same students are likely not going to want to wear hats on their head. So what do you do in that case when as a teacher you're saying, oh my goodness, it's it's minus who knows out, oh, you know, minus what temperature mm -hmm. that's happening in the environment out today. So you might be thinking, how am I going to help encourage this child to put on their hat and make sure that they're staying warm when it's winter time, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's just, as we sit here and talk, there's just so many examples that kind of play through my mind of, I think sensory avoidance is way more abundant than we really recognize because uh, it can often be confused as defiance or something else. Um, and really, if you're not looking for it, you almost don't see it. Right. But once you know what it is and you understand and you know how it can show up, I feel like you start to notice it everywhere. Absolutely. And I think even as adults, you know, we're similar. I don't think we all grow it. <laughs> it's definitely something that is lifelong. And mm. that is what I'm hoping um, that our listeners take away from today's conversation, that this is not something that a child is going to grow out of. Because mm -hmm. that's one of the, the questions I frequently get asked whenever I'm doing any kind of sensory assessment or a sensory profile or sensory questionnaire on a child that comes onto my caseload. Is this something that, you know, am I able to give a tool or a strategy and it's going to cure my child? But what I really want to highlight is that sensory processing is not something to cure because in fact, we all have sensory processing mm -hmm. preferences. All of us fall somewhere along the spectrum of either being oversensitive or undersensitive. So you had given an example of how when you're learning, you need silence. I'm the same way as well. Um, but both you and I as adults have come up with strategies and ways that we can help ourselves learn in order to be able to just function in our day-to-day -day lives. And, and right. that's and, what we want to do. And the reality is that in a classroom, we have all these different types of learners. So I might be seated right next to the child who is sensory seeking and they like to talk to their 
their neighbors, their partners, their group. They like to be active in their learning. They like to be hands-on. And we're sitting side by side in the same classroom and we both function completely opposite, right? So that's the challenge of, um, I think, some of our sensory avoidant friends is that when you need something, it's, it's really hard to get it in the school setting that we that is our reality right now. Mm -hmm. So I guess we should move on and talk about some of those strategies. What are some of those tools and strategies for some of those most common ones? Like we talked about um, things being too loud. I can think of, you know, some tools right away that are so easily implemented that can have a huge impact. So why don't you tell us some of your favorite uh, tools or strategies that can help some of our friends that present as sensory avoidant? Absolutely. And so let's go back to the example of a child who is sensitive or overly sensitive to sound. So having those loud sounds in the classroom, sometimes when the noise levels tend to get elevated a bit more, we have something that we can try with them. And, and I think you've potentially had some, I'm sure you've had some experience using these as well with some of your students. It's noise canceling headphones. Um, for younger students, you can also look at getting earmuffs or even earbuds, depending on how um, mature the child is and what their, I guess, tolerance of having things on their ears because they may also be sensitive to touch around their ears. Mm -hmm. So these are some other considerations that might um, be taken into account when we are trying to figure out if noise canceling headphones or earmuffs are going to be a successful strategy. Um, I do have a caveat with trialing noise canceling headphones with students because oftentimes what happens is they may be so overly sensitive to sounds that they want to wear them all the time but there is a risk potentially of getting desensitized to those headphones so sometimes too much of a th you know sometimes the too much of a good thing yeah exactly is is almost um counter effective or counterproductive to the goal that we're trying to achieve and helping these students get the most out of their learning experience so what i say about that is use it cautiously or use it judiciously use it at some points of the day maybe when it's going to be at peak noise levels in the classroom or if there's a fire alarm that's going to happen if you know that that's going to happen ahead of time um, having said that too it's not just about noise canceling headphones or earmuffs or equipment that we can give our children it's also giving them that advanced warning ahead of time mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. That that plays a huge part, especially when they're they're little, right? And again, as they start to get older, they learn to advocate a little bit for that, and they start to ask questions about what's coming, what's going to happen. I see those um, useful not just in the classroom, but also a lot of times in school assemblies or when there's a play or a concert. Um, you know, that's just way too much for some of our some of our friends who are sensory avoidant. So those noise canceling headphones at those opportune moments can really be a game changer at school, I think, for some of our friends. Oh, I've seen that time and time again. Mm -hmm. All right, what else would you recommend? I think um, another strategy that you might be able to try, and I, I do find it's a bit of trial and error with our sensory avoiders and trying to figure out what strategy or sometimes even combination of strategies is going to be helpful for them. I have had success with playing music or even calming sounds. Um, sometimes it might be a waterfall crashing, whatever that child finds soothing and calming without distracting them because at the end of the day, you still want them to be able to pick up on the information that they need to learn to be able to get the most out of their, their class assignments and, and get the work that they need done. I think this is uh, the constant conundrum with our, our older students is they want their earbuds in and their music on and the claim is, but I'm doing my work, right? And, and maybe our generation, because we didn't have earbuds in when we're doing our schoolwork, we're not getting that. But for some of our older students, it provides, provides that consistent, calming music that they enjoy, that they're used to, and it blocks out all of that other noise. And it actually allows them to focus and to do the task at hand where I think, I think we've come a long way in schools of accepting that. Mm -hmm. But I know sometimes we still, you know, see parents or educators that will say, well, you can't listen to music and do your schoolwork when in fact you can. 
Absolutely. And I've seen it again, depending on the student, depending on the child, depending on what their unique sensory profile is like. And mm-hmm. we all have one. Some people do well with listening to music. Some people need music to be able to concentrate, whereas other people like myself <laughs> need complete silence to be able to learn anything. Mm-hmm. So that reminds me of yeah. growing up. So in my house, my room was in the middle and my two sisters were on either side of me. And I'm like, I'm not sensory avoidant, but I also don't like loud things, right? Like I'm, I could tolerate them, but I'd be in my bedroom wanting silence, doing my homework or whatever. My two sisters will both want their music blaring and are playing different things. And I'm like stuck in the middle on this wall, turn it down, on this wall, turn it down. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I wish I knew what noise canceling headphones were then. <laughs> Might like have helped. It would have saved you a lot of headaches, I think, back I then, know. I imagine. <laughs> oh. Well, before we go, is there any other um, tool or strategy that you have? If we have time for one final one that you might want to mention here? I think, yeah. Why don't we go ahead and talk about that sensitivity to touch? Okay. I feel like we've already kind of teased some strategies and ideas as we've kind of talked through our conversation on today's podcast episode. Um, Some of the examples we gave are finding clothing Mm -hmm. for the child that just can't handle that sensation come of on heavy <laughs> solve this world issue for parents everywhere right now go ahead <laughs> oh goodness the struggle is real shannon the struggle is real oh yes yeah i know <laughs> yeah oh i can i can just imagine um and i and i do empathize with the parents and the children out there who do have um these sensor of sensory avoiders that don't like the feeling of certain fabric mm. and so Again, a lot of it is a trial and error process, but what I am really happy to see as an occupational therapist is that there's more awareness around our world, which means that vendors are picking up on the fact that there needs to be more made available commercially. Right. So people are more informed now and our buyers are more informed. So even just doing a quick search on amazon.ca, I found seamless socks for example, for Mm -hmm. kids who don't like the feeling of the seams. Or you can even try turning socks inside out and maybe that might be enough for the child who doesn't like that sensation. A really common one nowadays, tagless clothing. I was going to say that was my favorite because my son would be like, can you cut the tag off? The tag is scratching me. I'd cut it off. It's still scratching me. You could never get rid of the whole tag. And when I started finding clothing without that tag, it was like, my life became so much easier. <laughs> Thank you very much, whoever invented the no tag shirt. <laughs> Absolutely. They must be, um, be making quite a ton of money because I feel like this is a really common one that we encounter. I'm feeling like they had a sensory avoidant child somewhere in their family. <laughs> <laughs> I think they might have. <laughs> so I think um, the other thing, too, with children or even just anybody who does have that sensitivity to touch is not just thinking about clothing. It could be they're sensitive to the feeling of certain textures or um, substances. So sometimes you might see this in school when you have a child that doesn't want to play with Play-Doh and Mm -hmm. JK or SK. So there are simple solutions that we can do. We can actually give them a toy or a maybe not a fork, but a spoon or something a bit safer for them to use as an intermediary for them so basically touch the substance and explore it but with this thing that's in between you and your fingers right and then bit by bit you as the teacher you as the parent might be able to slowly model or show them that yeah it's actually safe it's okay to try touching it with one finger Mm -hmm. two fingers oh now I'm gonna I'm gonna get more courageous I'm gonna touch it with my whole palm so what I'm trying to show in this example is that there is a bit of sensory desensitization that can happen okay when yeah. you're slowly exposing the child mm-hmm. at a level they feel comfortable with and right. that's key it's it's following their lead following their pace yes not throwing them into the ocean but right. slowly but surely um at their pace introducing them to whatever it is that's causing the avoidance um and building some tolerance 
Absolutely. Mm, nice. So unlike other systems, this one can improve. <laughs> there is Because we have some that don't improve, but this is one where we can make some strides and we can improve and, and things can grow as we grow and we can do better. So there's hope. Yeah, there there's always hope. is hope. <laughs> uh, any, any final thoughts on um, our sensory processing system or being sensory avoiding you'd like to share with our listeners? I think at the end of the day, it's just recognizing that there are things that are in your power to give to our sensory avoiders to help them be comfortable in their skin and in the world around them. I agree. And I, if I was to add to that, I think it would be and to also give them the language to be able to communicate and advocate that themselves to others. Absolutely. Right? All right. Well, it's been an interesting conversation, Evie, as always. I love our little chats. Um, we could go on forever and ever, but, um, you know, it's a podcast, so we need to stop <laughs> at some point. Um, but I want to thank you again for being a guest on the show. It's always lovely to have you, and I'm sure we'll see you back again soon. It was such a pleasure, and I thoroughly enjoy our chat, Shannon. If you're a parent looking for more tools, strategies, or resources to support your child's learning, please visit my website, theparentseducator.com, or follow me at The Parents Educator on all social media platforms. Thanks for listening to the podcast, School is Dumb. More episodes can be found on your favorite streaming platform. Thanks for tuning in. Till next time.